Welcome back, y'all. With one failed experiment and another experiment that I'm still working on after two, almost three weeks, I'm finally back with something that actually worked. In this video, I'll be reducing benzoin to mesohydrobenzoin with sodium borohydride. The synthesis of benzoin by the benzoin condensation is very common in undergraduate organic labs. I'm not performing this reaction, so I won't go over it or anything else other than just mentioning it now. Uh, if you want to look into it, there's a plethora of information that you can easily find with the quick search. Now the reaction that I'm performing is also common in undergrad organic labs, and the procedure I'm using is a scaled up version of one that I found online. I think it's through the University of Massachusetts, but I'm not entirely sure. So the carbonyl group in benzoin, the double bonded oxygen, can be reduced to a hydroxyl group with sodium borohydride, which is a fairly mild reducing agent. I regretfully won't be covering the mechanism because the reduction of ketones with sodium borohydride, really using borohydrides in general, has had a very contested mechanism that has been under investigation for over 70 years, a lot of it being done in the last 50 years. A lot of the mechanisms described in papers published in the 70s have been further investigated beginning in about the early 2000s with the advancement of computational chemistry, uh, revisions being made as our understanding increased, some involving the sodium cation, some not, a number of proposed transition states, kinetic studies, and more. The fact that benzoin is an alpha hydroxy ketone, meaning it has the hydroxyl group on the adjacent carbon to the ketone group, that adds another factor to the mechanism because the reduction is highly stereoselective. I'm currently in email correspondence with the author of a paper published a little under five months ago that proposes a revised borohydride mechanism that I think is promising. From all the papers I've read, I compiled several proposed mechanisms I could show, but given how much time I've dedicated to finding literature on the mechanism, even delaying the release of this video by a few days, I'm going to save the mechanism for either another video entirely or a YouTube short, depending on how this email chain ends. I'm sort of bummed that the first video of an organic reaction that I'm posting won't have a mechanism, but chemistry is ambiguous, so it can't be helped. Please forgive me. Anyway, onto the video. I start out by adding 150 ml of ethanol to this 600 ml beaker, which seems too big, but it'll make more sense once I get to the workup. I add 15 grams of benzoin to this. Not all of it will dissolve, but that's okay. To control the reaction, which is exothermic, I'll be adding the 3 grams of sodium borohydride portion-wise. At this point, a voluminous precipitate is formed, and while it looks like nothing is going on, the reaction is proceeding as usual. It's just hard to see. Because of this, I didn't record the rest of the addition of the sodium borohydride, so we're just going to move on. After all of it was added, I continued stirring it at room temp for an additional 30 minutes or so. Then I set it into an ice water bath and kept on stirring. Adding the room temperature water to the thick slurry clears up the mixture at first, but after stirring in the ice bath for a bit, the hydrobenzoin reprecipitates. This has no effect on the quenching step, which is adding 7.5 ml of 6 molar hydrochloric acid a little at a time to control the hydrogen evolved from the decomposition of unreacted sodium borohydride. Water alone can quench the reaction as sodium borohydride is decomposed by water, but the speed of this is temperature and pH dependent and it's very slow at ice water bath temperature. Sodium borohydride is rapidly decomposed by acid, as you can see. Thankfully, the foaming never overflowed out of the beaker, but it did get very close. Also, don't mind me working on another project simultaneously. It takes a while for the foaming to die down in between additions, so I needed something to do. And then after I added all the hydrochloric acid, I did forget a step. I didn't in the trial run, but I did in the run that I actually recorded. Afterwards, I was supposed to add 75 mils of water, but I didn't. 
The yield will suffer from this a little bit, but not too much. The water added serves a few purposes. It participates in the hydrolysis of the borate esters present. It acts as a heat sink to keep the hydrogen evolution controlled during the HCl addition. And it lowers the solubility of the hydrobenz when formed, which is fairly soluble in ethanol and less soluble the more water is present. Onto the filtration. I wash the solid with about 500 mils of ice water, which seems like a lot, but it is less than the 750 mils that the procedure called for. I used 500 mils so I didn't have to empty my filter flask. I'm lazy. The boric acid and sodium chloride formed should be readily soluble, even in the cold aqueous ethanol, since there's so little of both of these salts, so I'm not entirely sure why the procedure called for so much water to rinse the product on the filter. Benzoin is something like 0.03% soluble in water, while hydrobenzoin is 0.25% soluble at 20 degrees Celsius, so I know for a fact that an appreciable amount of product is lost in the washing, even with it being ice water, but oh well. There's the crude dried hydrobenzoin. Here's my recrystallization setup. I transferred as much crude hydrobenzoin as I could from the petri dish to the beaker. I'll transfer the rest soon. In the bowl surrounding the beaker is perlite, an expanded volcanic glass that has a low bulk density due to the presence of air bubbles in it, making it a good thermal insulator. This will slow the cooling rate of the solution resulting in the formation of larger crystals of hydrobenzoin. This form of hydrobenzoin, mesohydrobenzoin, crystallizes in monoclinic leaflets, which are easily distinguishable from the six-sided monoclinic prisms of benzoin. For the recrystallization, I first add 130 ml of hot ethanol and then 260 ml of hot water. It took about 6 hours to cool to room temperature. Afterwards, I set the beaker in an ice water bath to cool it further. The crystals are very fluffy and bulky, so I push them down a bunch to squeeze out excess solvent during the filtration. I don't use a rubber dam for this like I did in the vermilion video because hydrobenzoin is super clingy Kind of like glitter or my ex, so any of it that would stick to the dam would be annoying to remove, and I didn't want to deal with that. I washed the crystals with about I don't know, 100 mils of ice water, and then you can see what I meant by leaflets just by looking at the dry product. It's self-explanatory. So I'm going to perform a TLC analysis of the starting material and the end product to test the purity. I dissolve a little of both of these in ethyl acetate, in these cute little vials and spot them on a TLC plate. One for starting material, two for end product. If you've done TLC before, you know what's about to happen, considering that I spotted way too much on the plate. I used, for the developing solvent, uh, 9 to 1 chloroform to ethanol. The literature procedure used dichloromethane instead of chloroform, but I don't have dichloromethane right now, and chloroform worked just fine. After developing it, looking at it, and being annoyed with myself for being dumb and spotting too much, I crudely did another plate with smaller spots, but honestly I, I should have done even smaller spots. Like you barely need any. It just has to be visible. I haven't done CLC for a while, so I'm out of practice. Regardless, I would say the product is pure by TLC. I also performed a melting point analysis of both compounds, but the melting points are nearly identical, so it doesn't prove much of anything. I had a hard time getting the camera to focus on my melting point apparatus's viewing lens for more than a few seconds of time, so I gave up on that. I'm pretty content with the yield. I know the majority of the remainder of it was lost because of the product's solubility in the reaction solvent, when it was watched on the filter, and obviously some during the recrystallization of the crude product, but that always happens. I should have done TLC on the crude product to see if the recrystallization was necessary, but I didn't, and that's okay. A 76% yield is good enough. The stereoselectivity of the reaction is partially demonstrated by the melting point of the product. The other potential products are these enantiomers, which both have a melting point of between 148.5 and 149.5 degrees Celsius, a little over 10 degrees higher than the mesoform. 
The mesoform, thankfully, has the ideal configuration for the reaction I plan on using it for in a future video. Mesohydrobenzoin has few applications outside of undergrad organic labs, which is why I didn't have anything to say about it in that regard during the video's intro. The enantiomers are used as chiral reagents, building blocks, ligands, or auxiliaries in H-symmetric synthesis. I'd have more to say on them if either of them were the desired products, but they weren't, so that's all I've got to say. Thank you for watching. If you want to, like, comment, and or subscribe, and I'll see you next time.